Cybernetic augmentation, the practice of implanting electronic machinery into the human body to restore or improve its abilities. Cybernetics have been a popular trope in science fiction for well over a century. The technology allows characters to have wonderful and amazing powers while also creating an avenue for superhuman abilities in an increasingly science-minded world. No gods or monsters here, just badass robot people. And before you blast us in the comments that Iron Man isn't a cyborg, we'll get there, hold your horses. Cybernetics are a huge part of the world in CDPR's Cyberpunk 2077, where the only people that don't have augmentations are the monks that can lead you through some surprisingly enjoyable meditation sessions. But everyone else has at least a few basic additions that allow them to function properly in society. So, in the spirit of the game, let's talk about cybernetics. How possible are they? How close are we to making them in real life? And how might they shape our society and cultures? In order to answer the first question, we should first look at just exactly what a cyborg is. When we think cybernetic augmentation, it brings to mind images of sci-fi tech, like making your entire arm a gun, that more often than not you end up killing yourself with, or surfing the internet with your mind. Artificial body parts, you know, that sort of thing. But a cyborg is just an organic being that has been implanted with a technological device to restore or improve its abilities. This means that there are cyborgs that are already living among us. Not in a lizard people run the government kind of way, but anyone with a hearing aid or a pacemaker is technically a cyborg, which does mean that for the first three movies at least, Iron Man is, technically speaking, a cyborg as well. And if you were to relax the definition just a little bit, there's an argument that most people in developed countries are already cyborgs. Our phones are becoming more and more important to our day-to-day -day lives. How bad does it feel to realise you've forgotten your phone somewhere? Almost like you've lost a limb or you've gone blind. It's also worth noting that using technology to augment human ability is pretty much the oldest trick in the book for our species. Philosophically speaking, how much different is holding a sword in your hand to having a sword for a hand? In order to have a robot arm, you need to control it, which means we need our electrochemical computer, i.e. the brain, to talk to the electrical computer, i.e. a computer. To do this, we need a BMI or brain-machine interface. Now BMIs are not a terribly new technology, in fact they've seen use since as early as 1978, albeit with limited success to help restore sight to blind individuals, and devices were being implanted in patients to control robotic limbs as early as 1998. A microelectrode array is a part of the BMI that detects your neurons firing, and the Utah array is the only one with FDA approval. It isn't the only one around, but it's a good baseline. The Utah Array has up to 128 electrode channels in a grid pattern that measure when and where a nerve fires, and then relays that information back to a computer. This technology is good enough for rudimentary movements, but it struggles to get more precise than moving individual fingers. So, what's next? Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, may be one that you're already familiar with. They have explicit goals of narrowing the divide between machine and artificial intelligence, and their BMI has nearly an order of magnitude more channels that can both read and write information to your brain. It also benefits from sitting inside your skull without breaking the skin, charges wirelessly, and has many of the same internal functions as a modern phone. This is a huge jump from the abilities of the Utah Array, so much so it has experts in the field sceptical. Musk's frantic pace of improvement flies in the face of standard progression of science, slow and steady. Musk has always been more aspirational than realistic, which isn't a bad thing, this is a technology that should be pushed, but the list of things that are worse to rush than brain implants is very short, even in the event that Neuralink is safe for its host in the long term. As you may have already guessed, information security is a huge ethical concern for this kind of device. In 1995's Ghost in the Shell, Motoku Kusanagi hunts a criminal hacking into people's minds, or ghosts, to alter their thoughts, memories and intentions for their own purposes. Musk has stated that security is a top priority, but when it comes down to it, no system is foolproof. As this technology advances and as it becomes commonplace, the question won't be if a brain gets hacked, but rather when. The technology itself isn't evil. You can't judge something based on the bad it might do. This technology can improve the lives of thousands, help replace limbs with high-functioning robotic prosthetics, or even restore body functions to paraplegics. Patients with locked-in syndrome could be given a voice or even their entire bodies back. Any one of these is reason enough to try and make BMIs a reality. Considering the current technology and interest in artificial intelligence, 
it seems unthinkable BMIs won't be advanced to their logical maximum. Just like phones with communication and the internal combustion engine with transportation, BMIs seem poised to revolutionise and create whole new industries. Only this one may let strangers airdrop Rick Astley into our brains. The human immune system is an extremely well-oiled machine. Our bodies are constantly being assaulted by microscopic attackers that think we'd be a good place to set up shop. But thanks to our immune system, it rarely happens. Even when something slips through the cracks, our bodies can remember past threats and grant us immunity going forward. There are two significant problems we have to overcome to really get to sci-fi levels of augmentation. First is the internal immune response. Second is a skin problem. You see, our bodies are very good at attacking anything inside us they think shouldn't be there. Today, 100% of medical implants cause an immune reaction, 35% of which require an additional surgery to fix. The other 65% of cases still have our bodies attacking the implant, damaging it and irritating the implant inside. For lifetime prosthetics, like you have in Cyberpunk 2077, the ratio of secondary surgeries would need to be lowered substantially. 35% is a lot of people, even now when implantations are fairly rare. Advancements in immune response control and biocompatible materials are 100% needed before we can reach the cyberpunk levels. The next portion of our immune system that we need to get around is actually the biggest part, your skin. You don't normally think of your skin as part of your immune system, but it's actually one of the most important parts. It acts as a passive immune system, strong walls keeping everything out, as they say, the best defence is, well, a really good defence. Which means that mods like this, or even this, are actually huge gaps in your body's defence. Neuralink's design has actually changed to reflect the challenges posed by this problem. Take the jack-in plug for example. Something like this would be at constant risk of infection and a source of painful irritation. Which is to say something like what Dum Dum here has is still a ways into the future. How does technology impact culture? Cell phones have hugely influenced Western culture over the past three decades, but they really only magnified the behaviours and desires we already had. We wanted to be closer to people. We wanted more people to pay attention to us or to bring the mundane things like banking into the 21st century. The technology that allowed that to happen has flourished. So what cultural itch would a technology like this scratch? Let's assume we overcome the technological hurdles we've laid out, and any other unseen challenges. Let's assume it's all perfectly possible. What would people do? Humans have been expressing themselves by altering their appearance since at least the Neolithic period. Our bodies have been canvases for the ultimate level of self-expression, often seen as the most extreme. Fashion is and always has been another huge influence on cultures throughout history. High fashion has been a mark of success and wealth for a millennia, and functional durable clothing has kept industries working for centuries. Clothing seems more vertical than lateral. Outside of a small amount of functional work clothing, or specific subgenre clothing, the only way we get better clothes is to buy designer clothing. Centuries ago, music was similar. You had the complexity and expanse of a full symphony, or simply a handful of locals playing as best they could. Now there are genres, subgenres, cultures and subcultures around these genres. Now there is a more lateral movement than vertical. A lot of music isn't better or worse, but musicians use different genres to express different ideals or emotions. Idolized cybernetic augmentation will do something similar for both fashion and body modding, maybe even make them one and the same thing. It will allow for a diversification of the human form changing what our bodies do for practical or aesthetic reasons on scales unthinkable today. It may not change the whole of society, but how we dress and even what dressing means might change. Could we have different limbs for different occasions? Will we have work legs? If augmentations could easily be swapped, then specialisation is inevitable. We could change our bodies based on what we're working on, our hobbies, how we want to express ourselves. The potential really is limitless. This technology is coming. It's been in the cultural perspective for over a century, and now the technology is catching up to our imagination. Depiction and discussion in creative spheres has always pushed technology from fiction into science. How this will affect society is a massive question, with too many facets and perspectives for a single video. We couldn't hope to adequately begin to cover the whole topic, even with years of dedicated research and introspection, 
And that's only the technologies we know about. There will be thousands of ways cybernetics will change the way we live forever. Many of those changes won't be truly felt until the years after the fact. Let's just hope cyberpsychosis isn't real. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. And we'll see you next time for more Fiction Talk.